what, what, what three things do we need to know about you? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I would say um, the first unique thing is I have been to, my husband and I have traveled to 27 countries in the last few years. Um, huge, huge travelers. And yeah, I don't know. I think my favorite, I'm just going to add to that. We yeah. were talking about like what are, have been our top three places that we've been to. So I would say Iceland, which we just did about a month ago, which is amazing. Um, Life-changing trip, Japan and Scotland. Crikey, so a real, <laughs> a real breadth of my word. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. What a, what a great trip. Um, um, and, uh, let's see, the uh, next, yeah, the next fun fact about me would be um, I did not go to college and kind of faked it till I made it. So, you know, for anyone that <laughs> feels totally, that feels like, they are, you know, struggling to, to, to find where they belong in their career or they're just not sure. I say try a million things and fake it till you make it because only you can really, you know, tell yourself that you can't do something and, and you have the power to change that narrative. And I think, you know, the, the amazing thing about my career that I'm, I'm really proud of is that even though I heard a lot of no's along the way, I, I use that to kind of propel myself forward and create the career that I have today, which has been 12 years in this industry and working with some of the world's biggest brands and on some of the most amazing campaigns. And if you told me, if you, if you told 20 year old me that I would be where I am today, I honestly, I wouldn't have believed it, but Listen. you know, don't, don't let anything stop you. Listen, what I feel like we should end there. Finish <laughs> that's all we need to hear and the third the third point the third thing is um i started a youtube travel channel is that a good thing or a bad thing i don't know yet it's so funny because like i was saying and point number one my husband and i travel all over the place um i do travel photography i have my instagram account but and it's funny because like, you know, we're in this industry, right? We're in marketing, we're in social, we're in digital. We give all the advice to everybody else. But I think taking the advice for ourselves can be a little, feel a little bit daunting. So I was like, you know what? Why not me? So I started a YouTube travel channel with my husband just kind of along for the ride, but he's like, sure, do the thing. And uh, that was, you know, a couple of days ago. So we'll little, see how it goes. But that, that is another fact. We'll put the link in the bio. Fabulous. Oh, God. Now, like, the pressure is on. I have to put all this content up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, Jenna, you referenced 20 year old you, if 20 year old you could see that. I want to go back a little bit earlier and look at like eight or 10 year old Shana. And when did you first start having relationships with brands? You know, how, how young were you or old were you? You know, when you can really remember that a brand started to resonate with you as a young person. Yeah, I think. You know, it wasn't necessarily so much a brand, but it was storytelling and creating mm -hmm. narrative. And, you know, when I was younger, going back to the college thing, not having a college degree was a massive deal. And I... The negative, as in... In a negative, yeah. So not having a college degree was definitely a negative. And it was up to me to figure out how to spin that and what type of story I wanted to tell and how I wanted to tell that story. So for me, when I was 23, I decided to start writing, right? And I started my own vlog. I was living on the West Coast at the time. I'm originally from New York, but I moved out to the West Coast. And I just started writing about life in San Diego. And I had this little blog called Sassy in San Diego. And I would go around and ask shop owners their story and really just start writing about, you know, what made their cafe so unique or what made them want to start their little fashion boutique. And it was really the creative writing and the storytelling aspect that got me really interested in marketing. And then I started working for small businesses, like local businesses, helping them with their branding and storytelling. I went to the school of Barnes and Noble, was reading PR books and marketing books at nights at night and on the weekends. 
And it was then that I realized, you know what, I'm really good at this. Yeah. And I have a lot of creative ideas. And I just started to apply to jobs in general. I didn't know what vertical I wanted to be in. I just knew I want to do this for a living. I want to get paid to do this. I want to explore my creativity in ways that I never thought were possible. And I want to be challenged. So I was like, oh, marketing associate, apply. I didn't care if it was in a dental office. I didn't care if it was in, you know, uh, like I was at like some small fashion boutique or local business, whatever I could get, I would take. And from there, I really started honing in on my skills until I moved back to the East Coast and applied to work, excuse me, to work at a magazine doing their marketing. I, by some miracle, had bs my way through that interview and I got the job and it was just like I did it I got my foot in the door right with a reputable what company what, what was the company called if you don't mind me asking <laughs> of course so the magazine was called downtown magazine um they're no longer in print today but they were focused on covering all things related to downtown Manhattan so financial district um businesses restaurants um fashion boutiques beauty i mean they really kind of covered everything they were doing a lot of advertorial so we had an online component which i really knew like a little about like i had my you know blog but i didn't i i just didn't know that world so what did i do again i went online i did my research and i taught myself as i went along and then i also made sure that i was in rooms that other people I aspired to be were in and just just asked them millions of questions and learned as much as I could. And then I, I took that experience and then got a job at a tech startup leading social media, which again, still figuring out. It was still really new at that time, but got a job at te in a tech company and, and launched this whole social media plan for all of these clients across several different verticals. And then from there, I went into hospitality, did marketing and PR, and my career has just kind of been going ever since. So it's been, it's been a crazy journey. It's, it sounds absolutely incredible and extremely <laughs> passionately driven. For you, you know, in, emerging into this world when you started off, what was it about storytelling that, that drove you to, to want to tell these stories or to create these stories? Being able to move somebody just with your words or a visual or bringing them into what they're seeing on the screen, even if they're not there, there is no greater feeling in the world than having someone watch your piece of content and feel something, whether it's happiness, it's sadness, it's anger, it's whatever it is, just setting out to make them feel like they are a part of that story in some form. I mean, I get this way, even when I watch movies, I'll watch something and something dramatic will happen and I'll start crying because I will feel so invested in the characters or in the storyline that I am rooting for this person on the screen, you know, and even though we're talking about social media, we're not necessarily talking about a feature length film here. You know, I think we can do the same in even just 15 seconds, Absolutely. right? Drive some type of emotion in somebody, depending on the piece of the content, whether it's excitement or like a fear of missing out. If we're talking about product marketing, oh my God, this product looks so cool. I want to be part of that community, right? Or right. like traveling when I follow these, you know, travel vloggers or travel brands or hotels. I'm like, I can see myself at this resort or I can see myself hiking up this mountain. I want that feeling. I want to be part of that story. And that happens within the first, not even 15 seconds. I would say within the first five seconds, because it's not just about the visual. It's about the music. I'm huge into music because I believe music can set the tone for anything that you're creating. So it's about the music. It's about the caption copy. It's about the voiceover. It's about the visuals. It's about the tone of the video and the graphics, if you're using graphics. So I think all of these things come together to yeah. get people excited about the brands, the journey, whatever it is you are telling the story of. And I think sometimes we forget that. So I try to, to hone it back in on what am I trying to do with this? Am I trying to make people feel excited or make them feel like they just want to be a part of this or maybe a little bit of both? 
Um, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's the emotional connection of the storytelling. What challenges do you feel yeah, young people are having? And I guess, secondly to that, how do you feel brands are responding to that? Yeah, um, the biggest challenge is being disconnected and being okay to be offline. You know, I think uh, I, I think we're uh, probably around the same age, and I remember, you know, not not having my cell phone on me all the time, and Instagram to scroll, and yeah. you know, just being outside in nature and playing with friends and and not worrying about anything else. And you know, I do I feel for this generation because they will never know what that is like, you know, or if they do, it's going to be on a much different scale, right? Um, I think brands have a responsibility to help the younger generation find that balance and unfortunately almost give them permission to disconnect. Like one of my favorite, favorite campaigns was from, I believe it was Patagonia who, you know, said get offline and disconnect and they like shut everything down during Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and they closed their stores. And it was so shocking because no brands had ever encouraged people to disengage from their brand marketing during the most hottest selling time of the year and get outside. And that in and of itself probably not only drove insane amount of brand awareness, but it allowed people to have this sense of, it's okay. Like I still support the brand because I also feel like people still, when they find a brand that they love, they want to be super connected to that brand and support them all the time. And they don't want to disconnect from them necessarily because they want to be in that community. Mm -hmm. um, but having this message of it's okay to log off and we'll see you in a few days was just, it was so brilliant. And, and I think that's where brands can be responsible and maybe even just creating, you know, when we look at brands and, and there are a lot of brands are tapping into experiential because, you know, it's all about bringing the online offline, especially for e-com brands. But now I'm seeing, seeing like brick and mortar stores start to do that too. Like H&M did this like mini pop-up of stores in Williamsburg, even though they are a global retailer and have stores all over the place, they created different unique experiences that were, that were around wellness and health and balance and i really love that they did that because they were they were really integrating both like their brand and marketing with like go do yoga for 45 minutes in our yoga studio and cell phones go in the locker you know yeah. shut off and disconnect we're hosting meditation classes so i think if brands can find unique ways that make sense for them to enter that brand marketing life balance, then it's going to be very, very successful. But how Gen Z is interacting with brands, it's, you know, we as brands, we used to drive the conversation, not anymore. You know, our communities are driving the conversations, they're telling us what they want, you know, and as much as algorithms can, you know, determine what content we're producing, it's actually not the algorithm when you think about it. It's the person behind the screen scrolling or deciding to stop scrolling on that you know and the algorithm really is just reacting to that and saying hey these 100 people right for example TikTok sends your content out to 100 people if people start interacting with it they'll continue seeding it but once it hit, hits below a certain interaction threshold it's dead in the water those that community is driving that interaction so i think what brands need to do is bring the generations into the fold, ask them what they want to see, you know, make them part of the brand conversation versus speaking at them. And I'm seeing a lot of brands starting to do this and hiring influencers to tell their story, hiring influencers as creative directors or brand strategists, because they really understand the market. And yeah. it's, a, it's a positive shift. Do you get the sense, and it's almost go back to the storytelling aspect, what we do, so, yep. that brands have almost lost control of how they tell their story and it's dictated to by the consumer now, or is there a balance or, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think that for the most part, it's shifted to like a 60-40. So 60% the consumer, 40% mm. the brand. 
And the consumer really is driving so many narratives, so many cultural moments, so many um, trending moments through social listening, which is so important, and yeah. market research. Brands are now being more informed than ever, specifically what audiences want to see and expect from them. And that, that wasn't always the case. There, it was always that one one sided thing. And then it shifted to this, you know, brands are producing fun and, and educational content or, you know, entertaining content and this looks great. But then consumers got tired and burnt out of seeing the same stuff and kind of revolted and were like, well, we're going to create our own content. And that's when during the pandemic, content creators skyrocketed everyone's like what the hell else are we doing at home we're just going to create content you know people that always wanted to step into that field but didn't either have the courage to do so or have the time to do so we're like screw it we're doing it and we saw this huge uptick in this new thing that we call content creators right it was always influencers influencers that was always the goal now not everyone wants to be an influencer and they shouldn't we have amazing content creators creating incredible storytelling and and brand marketing and working on their own personal marketing and they are really the driving force behind a lot of amazing brand marketing that we see today you know brands are pulling inspiration from those content creators or pulling them in as partners to help them create better UGC style content. And it's, it's a really great thing. I, I love that we've given power back to the consumer and back to the content creator to tell the brand story in a super authentic way. Yeah, absolutely. The perceptions of Playboy versus the reality of kind of what's happening within your space. Um, how do you feel those perceptions are, uh, are shifting for younger audiences towards the brand? So we really are focusing big time on bringing back Playboy to what it was in its glory day. We are focusing on lifestyle. We are focusing on music, arts, entertainment, culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Gen Z is really driving that. They're telling us what they want to see. They, they miss the art. So whenever we post about art on Instagram, they're like, we miss this. We love this. Or whenever we have an amazing editorial, they're like, yes, the writing at Playboy is back and they get excited. Um, we recently started doing stuff with musicians and artists. By this time next year, it'll be published, but we're shooting Kesha. Um, you know, she has an album coming out and we're shooting her in studio tomorrow, actually. And you know, people want to see that from us. They want to see us working with these groundbreaking artists and telling their stories. So for us, we're letting them tell us what we need to be in this next round because there have been teams and teams of people coming in over the past few years and they've been trying to push a specific narrative that people weren't asking for from us, wow. right? And so this goes back to what I was saying. It has to make sense for the brand and it, people have to be like, yes, this is what I expect from Playboy and this is what I want to see again. And and previous teams were not doing that. And wow. so now we're we're giving our community almost carte blanche to tell us like, hey, what do you want us to do? And we're doing it. Right. Yeah. That's how we're flipping that that right. narrative of of what we are and what we're what we want to become. We're building this new Playboy 2.0 with our current community and with a new community that loves the nostalgia of the brand but isn't sure what we are now. So we're like, we don't know either. You tell us what we are and let's like, do this together. You know, a bygone day, it's like it's it's like it's in there's a there's a there's a hunger for it, you know, an appetite. Yeah. Um and then finally Shayla, you're speaking at our event in March. We're yeah. looking forward to seeing you. Any previews that that you want to share with our audience of kind of what you'll be talking about and what you'll be yeah sharing on stage. The biggest thing I'm going to talk about is um shifting brand perception. You know, I I have worked at a few legacy brands. I've worked for Conair. I've worked for um, HP Sprocket and Kodak. And I've worked for Rainbow Fashion. Um, and now I'm currently at Playboy. And these are all really big legacy brands that have been around forever. And I really want to hone in on the journey of a rebrand and what that looks like and the challenges the failures because any company that has ever gone through a turnaround talks about their success but i don't think that they necessarily talk about some of the failure points and i think 
that's a big miss, right? We need to understand what didn't work, why it didn't work so that we can move forward. And so I want to hit on all of that, you know, the failures, the successes and how to move, how to just keep the needle moving forward. Fantastic. Well